of the, the Jewish community. And uh, to own a book was an act of defiance. It was a, a capital crime. Uh, yet all over the ghetto, there were people who had books. Uh, uh, my father had his stash of favorite books by Yiddish authors, by Sholem Aleichem and Sholem Ash and Le Paris, all remarkable Yiddish authors, nights, windows blinded with covers, keeping our existence secret. My father would pull out his books and read to us and bring to life remote worlds. Uh, we even had theaters. Imagine theaters when there was no bread. There was a remarkable historian and author in the ghetto. His name was Chaim Kaplan. And he said that it is remarkable that when we don't seem to need it at all, we need poetry more than we need bread. And it is true. The soul needs to be nourished just as the body does. I believe that our ability to, to think for ourselves and not to follow blindly our ability to create, our ability to think is our godliness. And all over the ghetto, heroic teachers met with children in little rooms, teaching them to hold on to their imaginations and trust and love. Listening to you talk about the forms of resistance, I'm thinking about how often I've heard how Jews went to the, like sheep to the slaughter, and how absolutely untrue that is. Absolutely not. You know, when we finally, uh, and we'll come back to, to that, but now that you brought my attention to it, we did not scream, though when we were marched, I wanted to jump at the throats and scratch their faces. But I did not. For I did not, I wanted to protect my parents. And I also did not want to give them the satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You know, when people are walked to gallows, when people are soldiers, when they are defeated, or when people are faced with terminal illness, we don't scream, we don't cry. We want to make the exit with dignity. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I just can't get over the way you speak. It's so beautiful. She's a writer, and, and you spent all those years teaching and writing, and you just speak so beautifully. I thank well, you. Well, that goes to prove that suffering, suffering can make you recognize that the meaning of life is life itself and the glory of seeing a rising sun. And, 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 uh, and the appreciation, the sacredness of, of human life every life. Mm -hmm. Oh, moving on. The Nazis started deporting large numbers of Jews out of Warsaw to death and concentration camps in 1942. For a substantial period of time, your family was able to avoid being deported. How did your parents manage to keep you from being taken by the Nazis, and how were you able to survive during that time? Um, in July 1942, the month of my 13th birthday, things became even more gruesome. This was the beginning of the deportations. We had no inkling that the deportations meant death. Some people were forced to write false letters to families and friends, inviting them to places where they were fed and clad and sheltered, so you can imagine that some people went unwillingly and unknowingly to death. Uh, many people hid. My family hid. Now, where does one hide in an apartment building? 
pretty much where children play hide and go seek. We hid behind chairs, we hid behind couches, we hid in cupboards and drawers, between mattresses and box springs. My family, my mother, sister, and I, my sister was a year and a half older. Uh, we hid in a secret room and put a wardrobe uh, to obscure the, um, the door. Um, but the, the deportations began in July 1942. Between July 1942 and September 1942, in barely two months, 99% of the children in the ghetto were gone. I was among the 1% still alive. Can you imagine a world without the sound of children, without the presence of grandmothers or grandfathers, because children and old people were the first to be uh, deported and killed. I cannot imagine how anyone who loves the mothers and fathers, who loves their children and friends, can do such a horrendous thing. This is why I'm sharing the difficult story. This is why you are doing the work that you are doing, Daryl. This is why I believe you are all here, to be reminded that human beings are capable of grave unkindness, of grave cruelty. And in that memory, in that, re in that realization, to recognize the importance and the power of love. <clears throat> Estelle, you were in, living in the ghetto during the remarkable Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Your father was involved in the resistance. Yes. Could you talk about the, the, the horrible obliteration of the, of the ghetto and especially what happened to you during the uprising and what happened to your family in particular? Um, as soon, well, we never heard from the people who were wrenched away from us, but a few people managed to come back under the cover of night, come back to the ghetto and tell us about the horrendous train rides to a place called Treblinka where our people were guests. At that point, the people began to organize themselves in armed resistance, and my father was a member of the armed resistance too. Uh, by then, there were so few people left in the ghetto. Uh, we lived in a, an apartment building um, four stories high, where well, actually like four blocks surround the a, a court. We were the only family alive. I remember sometimes going out to the gate and trying, hoping to hear the sound of another human being. And all I could feel was, 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 the, was the sound of silence. It was palpable. And, uh, uh, and so the, uh, the resistance fighters began to build bunkers uh, in uh, basements. We moved from our second floor apartment to the ground floor that was, was empty. So was no, no, no problem, and we built a, uh, a, a bunker too. Uh, also, the resistance fighters built tunnels to navigate between the bunkers and to get to the other side of the wall um, to obtain um, arms from the Christian underground. They also used the sewers a great deal. How? <laughs> How well, did they use the sewers? Well, you'd be amazed. It was uh, yeah, amazing how resourceful human beings can be, mm -hmm. how wonderful they can be, and how destructive they can be. And this is why we are all here, mm -hmm. right? 
So um, events erupted with Nazi um, uh, columns marching into wars, so with, with, uh, with, tanker, with tanks and armored cars and flags of armored uh, and flags of bomber planes. And they, uh, at that point, we pulled our trap door to the bunker up, which was um, the powder room floor and the commode all lifted and we stepped down that flimsy um, uh, ladder, pulled the trap door down. We felt abandoned. The, the, the ceiling pressed down on us. The, the damp walls closed us in. The ticking of the clock was our only clue when morning was rising and sun was setting. The flickering of the carbide light, we had no electricity, was our substitute for the sun. How I craved for the open horizon, for the blue crispness of day. And at some point, a grenade was thrown into our bunker, and we were dragged out. And there was, there was no place to hide anymore. And that was after one month. You held out one month. Is that right? No. It, it, the one month, right, well, yes. I don't, I, I think actually, I don't know how long we were. You probably have the correct uh, information. <laughs> I got it out of your book. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you see, I just don't remember. Uh, the, the, <laughs> actually, the freedom fighters, which is very, is very remarkable and very not, noteworthy, that facing, while we were in the bunker, fighting broke out in the streets. Facing a 20th century army, armed from head to toe, facing armored cars, facing tanks, the, the, the sky was dark with, with, with flocks of planes, bombs dropping, was a handful or a band of, of uh, freedom fighters, poorly clad, poorly fed, poorly armed. They climbed up on rooftops. They stepped in front of open windows. They crawled out of the tunnels and sewers and lobbed Molotov cocktails. And it took them longer to fight than it took for Poland or France to capitulate. And I think that this is very noteworthy. It's amazing. I know that there are no words to adequately describe it, but could you tell us about Madonic extermination camp? Right. Yes. Where you were sent with your parents and your sister, and you lost your beloved father. Yes. So they dragged us out from the uh, 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 bunker, and we did not march like 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 a like a swarm of nameless people who were people with names with love sometimes young people ask me how did i feel inside and i tell them i felt no different than you feel and my grandchildren feel i too wanted to take my family and friends for granted i too wanted to play and uh, the only difference is that you can do it, and we couldn't do it, and which, that you can do it is right, that we couldn't do it was wrong. And so they marched us, the buildings were, were crumbling at our feet. Uh, flames, enormous tongues of flames were licking the sky and painting it in otherworldly colors of iridescence, marched us to Umschlagplatz, the deportation um, station loaded us onto f trains. And uh, in the morning, we um, ended up in Maidanic extermination camp, where the end of my horizon was marked by, uh, by the thorns of electrified barbed wire fences, 
where every few feet were sentries and towers, where, where the crematorium and the chimney was right in front of us. Um, and my father was guest in my Danek. My mother and sister and I um, survived, obviously I did. I, um, uh, by, by a mere coincidence, a, a, a random luck, my sister was put on a list and we assumed that uh, anyone who was on the list was designated for the guest chamber. So, uh, and we had a pact that if one of us would go to the guest chamber, all three of us would go. So therefore, when my sister was put on the list, the only logical um, thing for us to do, for my mother and me, was to trade places with two other women who hoped to see another sunrise. The following morning, the names were called, and we reported, and they marched us. We were absolutely sure we were going to the guest chamber but they marched us onto freight trains and we ended up instead of a um, instead of a killing factory an extermination camp we were uh, uh, we were transported to a slave labor camp which essentially the essential difference was that there was not a killing there were no crematorium mm -hmm. But we worked in an ammunition factory, and we oh, the camp also was surrounded by electrified barbed wire fences. There were also sentries, and we were isolated and mistreated. Let's go back. Um, when was the last time you saw your father at Madonic? The last time I saw my father my, in my Danik, um, the men and women were s separated and, uh, and uh, placed on the ground. And uh, we were waiting. We didn't know for what. And my father was sitting in front of the group of men. And I was so used to looking in my father's eyes for comfort, for reassurance. He was such a dignified mm -hmm. and noble person. And he looked, he, he was sick. He had tuberculosis. And I, his eyes were so filled with sorrow. Mm -hmm. So while uh, the sentry, the, the guards were walking, 